to motivate a little bit better the usefulness of Bayes' rule, I'd like to provide a very basic explanation of Bayesian decision theory. Just scratching the surface with a simple example to understand better the different quantities that are involved in Bayes' rule that we've seen in the previous unit. So let's consider a digit classification task where the goal is to classify digits A versus B. We have just two digits and we want to classify, if you see a picture, you can see this pixel matrix here. If do we see a picture of an A or a picture of a B? So we want to classify new digits such that the probability of some error metric is minimized. Now we can approach this problem in the following way. We can think about, well, what is the prior distribution of these digits to occur? How often do the letters A and B actually occur in natural text? And we can say, well, A is a rather common letter, so it might occur four times more often than the letter, or three times more often than the letter B. So let's assign the probability for class one, which is the class corresponding to letter A, to be 0 0.75 and the probability for class 2, C2, which is the class corresponding to letter B, to be 0 0.25, to reflect the fact that A's occur more frequently in natural text than B's. Note that the prior has to be a distribution. In particular, if we sum over the entire state space, over the entire domain, then we must obtain one, which is the case here, right? So maybe we have obtained this number simply by counting how often these letters occur in certain texts on Wikipedia, and these are the results, right? And we normalize them such that we get 0 0.75 and 0 0.25 that sum to one. We now describe every digit using some feature vector x. For example, this feature vector could contain or describe the number of black pixels in each image or the relation between the width and the height, the aspect ratio. Some very simple features. Could also be something more complex, like features derived from some neural representation, etc. But let's consider something very simple. Let's consider even a one-dimensional feature space for now, just because it's much easier to visualize. Right? Let's assume we have a one-dimensional feature vector. And so the likelihood is now defined as, or specifies how likely a particular x has been generated from um, like the conditional di distribution p of x given the class either A or B, right? So we have now two cases. We have the case where we condition on the category A and on the category B, and we have two different distributions, hopefully different distributions. If they would be the same, we couldn't discriminate, right? Um, so our features must be to some degree discriminative. And you can see that they are to some degree here. So we have like the features that correspond to pictures of A's to be well, um, distributed like this, where the distribution is a little bit more towards the left as compared to the distribution that's a little bit more narrow and more towards the right of features that correspond to the letter B. Right? But you can also see that they are not completely disjoint. It's not a trivial classification task. There might be an image where the features are somewhere overlapping both with uh, like uh, like um, yielding a high likelihood for both the class A and the class B. So here's an example. Let's consider a particular image that is represented as this feature, this one-dimensional feature. So in this in this case here, which class should we assign x to? Right. Well, obviously we should assign it to the green class, right, class A, because this has a much higher probability, much higher likelihood um, than the red one. What about this one? Which class should we assign X to? Well, obviously, in this case, we should assign it to class B. 
But if we are like more in between these two classes, it becomes less clear. So what about this one here? Which class should we assign the x to? Well, while it looks like that class B has a higher likelihood here, which is true, we should still assign it probably to class A because class A has a higher prior probability of occurring, right? So we know that class A on average occurs more frequently and that should increase our probability with which we pick class A. So even though the likelihood is slightly smaller than for class B, we want to pick class A. So how do we formalize this intuition? And this is where Bayes' theorem comes into play. So I copied the Bayes' theorem from the previous unit here. And we're going to apply this now in our context where, um, well, y now corresponds to the class and x to the feature. In other words, we have p of the class given the features is equal to the probability of, so this is called the posterior, this is equal to the probability of the likelihood that we've already seen, the features with respect to a particular class times the prior probability for that class. And that divided by the so-called evidence, which is the, um, well, the marginal distribution of x. Um, and that is typically a constant, in particular if, we, if we're looking for the most likely class, this is a quantity that doesn't contain um, ck, right? But we can describe it, of course, also as the marginal distribution if we have this um, joint distribution described by this, the product of these two terms, and if we marginalize over the classes, then we obtain p of x. So here's the formula repeated from the last slide. And in particular, we are going to use in Bayesian uh, decision theory the following naming convention. The left one is called the posterior. Then we have the likelihood times the prior over the normalization factor, which is also called the partition function or the evidence, and sometimes denoted with the symbol C, but often for decision making not so relevant because it's constant with respect to the quantities that we seek. And so we can also look at this visually. Here in the first image we have the two likelihoods from before. But now if we multiply them with the prior, right, we have to multiply the likelihood with the prior, then these curves change significantly. And if we now divide by the normalization factor, we obtain basically the green curve here and the red curve here, where we see the decision boundary very clearly now, which is exactly at the point where these two curves cross. So if we are left of that intersection point, we should probably assign the image that we have recorded the feature x of to class A and otherwise to class B. So in short, in a nutshell, Bayes' decision fund, uh, theory models the prior and the likelihood and then decides for a class with the highest posterior. But this is, of course, not the complete picture. Decision theory typically also additionally considers, for example, a loss function or a risk in order to perform empirical risk minimization. For example, not all outcomes are equally desirable, right? So for example, if you want to detect cancer, then um, if, you, if you have a false negative, um, that is um, um, much more harmful than a false positive, right? If you detect cancer, um, in case there is no cancer, then you will start maybe a treatment but quickly discover that there is no cancer. But if you don't detect cancer in the first place, then the patient might die at some point. So not all of these uh, should be treated equally, right? So an additional loss or risk function is typically used in order to consider the entire uh, risk assessment, but it integrates b uh, the Bayesian way of treating likelihood and prior as we've discussed here. 